Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be here at Simmons, and I'd like first to say a second thank you to David Weaver, who Jeanette Bastian's archives class read the New Yorker article that I'd written about the fate of old newspapers and asked me last year if I needed some help. And my wife and I had, at that time, 60 pallets of old newspapers, many, many tons, mostly bound, bought directly or indirectly from the British Library after I'd tried unsuccessfully to convince the library to keep them. There we're sitting in a brick textile mill in Rollinsford, New Hampshire. Please raise your hand if you can't hear me. And they've been packed by the library in more or less random order. Some of the titles we bought were the last minute remaining intact long runs in any library. If we hadn't bought them on behalf of a nonprofit that I'd formed, they would be cut up and sold piecemeal by a dealer who was in the birthday newspaper and historical headline business. So yes, we needed help. David Weaver got a Simmons internship approved despite the fact that I am not a professional librarian or a professional archivist. And he drove up on weekends and he and I began unwrapping pallets and sorting through hundreds of shelves up. He did some inventories and he gave the whole enterprise a massive forward boost. Now with the further help of a few dozen volunteers, the collection is mostly sorted and can be used by appointment by people who want to see what these published urban landmarks of 50 or, 100 and, or 120 years ago actually looked like. So thank you, David. Thank you, Simmons. And if some of you want to help out with shelving or indexing over the summer, <laughs> or next year, we'd be very grateful. Richard Cox and I are here to talk about original format, formats in a virtual world. But it's framed as the great paper debate. And I feel that so as not to disappoint you all, we should both totter out wearing sumo wrestler diapers <laughs> and go at it. Richard zapping me with a handheld laser scanner while I brandish a 1942 volume of the New York Herald Tribune. <laughs> There's clearly a feeling in some quarters that by criticizing in detail noble institutions such as the Library of Congress and famous Washington library leaders such as Werner Clapp and Patricia Batten that I have wrongly demeaned the entire profession of librarianship. I don't think that's true. I believe, on the contrary, that I'm protecting the integrity of the profession of librarianship from some very powerful people who led it astray. The people I criticized were those who, in my opinion, used lots of federal money to push libraries into making terribly destructive mistakes, mistakes that we will never be able to recover from fully. We must learn more about the evolution of these mistakes and the little euphemisms such as preservation and reformatting that shielded them from view. I wrote the book not just because I'm upset by what's happened, which I certainly am, but because librarians who knew much more about the day-to-day -day realities of libraries than an outsider like me knows told me that they were upset about what has happened. There are lots who feel completely powerless in, in their institutions, who know that what is going on is wrong, but who haven't had been able to communicate that wrong to anyone who can expose it or counteract it. Just last week, I got a letter from some librarians at the Library of Congress. I'd like to read you some of it. These librarians write, some of us have had our professional careers abolished for standing up against the mass destruction of the nation's literary heritage. By writing this letter, we will again be under fire and in danger of losing our jobs. Top library managers do not tolerate dissent from the party line. We have been told that the sixth floor, a nickname for library management, is upset by our contact with you. We protest this siege mentality. The writers of this letter call the Library of Congress's preservation program misguided. The problems of storing books and newspapers are resolvable, they say. The problems of politics and egos are another matter. As I'm sure all of you here know, there's nothing monolithic about li what librarians think, which is why I point out in the preface to my book that great libraries employ, and here I'm quoting, a great many book-respecting people who may not know of or approve of what their superiors or their forebears have done. We need a national library that's willing to commit to the ordered storage of the things that people have actually published and read. Whole cities once read the newspapers 100 years ago. No other sources of words 
and imagery entered so many minds consistently every day. 50 years ago, the Library of Congress had 67,000 bound volumes of late 19th and 20th century newspapers from every big city in the country. According to a man who knew the collection well, these files were immaculate. They couldn't wait to get rid of them, he told me. Of this intergenerational bounty, only a few thousand volumes remain to be microfilmed. The rest have already gone. And much of the microfilm that replaced the original papers was bought and filed away sight unseen without even a spot check for quality. One of the tragedies of newspaper history is that the biggest and most important papers, the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, the Chicago Tribune, were microfilmed earliest and least well because they were the ones that were likely to sell to other libraries. And then those libraries sold or dumped their originals. Why do you need to keep the originals? Because they're beautiful and interesting and old, of course. Because the paper that they are made of is the very paper that went through the four and six color hoe printing presses at the time. And thus they are the best, and thus they are best able to convey the complete testimony of the past. And just as important, because they serve as the source for new copies. The New York Times Company and Bell and Howell have announced that they will be selling libraries a digital facsimile of the Times going back to 1851. That's great. But where do they turn to make their digital facsimiles? The Times doesn't have a file of its own paper. And the New York Public Library's run has large gaps, including a 10-year gap from 1915 to 1925. So digitizers are turning to Bell and Howell's microfilm of the Times. The electronic version will come not from the original, but from black and white film. And much of the richness of the line art and the rotogravure photography sections will be lost. And no matter how good Bell and Howell's despeckling software, that's what they call it, is, and no matter how high their scanning resolution is, they will once again be selling libraries, many of whom once owned <coughs> the Times in the original, something that looks like mediocre microfilm. The searchable text that comes from the scanned file is going to be a mess at times because the OCR software isn't going to have enough information to chew on. My wish that libraries do a better job in keeping what people actually read and have read is independent of what may happen with electronic publishing. Maybe in two years or two months, most people will be reading the New York Times and books exclusively as phosphors on a screen. If so, keep screen images of the phosphors. At the moment, though, most people read the Times as sheets of rattly paper covered with pictures and advertisements. And yet no library right now is keeping the New York Times in paper. Not one, as far as I know. Libraries subscribe to the Times and the microfilm of the Times, and then they toss out the paper after a brief holding period. I'm not alone in being surprised and dismayed at this. Most people I talk to are. Am I saying that libraries should be saving every single copy of every edition of every single paper in the country? Of course not. I'm saying that right now we're saving no current copies, zero. And clearly, we can do better than this. And I'm saying that once upon a time, libraries owned, just by happenstance, different editions of the same daily papers because they'd been sent different editions, which they'd bound in their wisdom. And these textual differences, these differing headlines and pictures and articles, were lost when they submitted the copy for what they had. And I'm saying that the US newspaper program is still today paying libraries to film old originals and then allowing them to throw the papers out to free up space. Does that mean that I insist that libraries must save everything at the turn of the last century, Joseph Pulitzer published half a million or a million copies of the New York world every day. Almost all of these copies are gone. They're cut up, burned, destroyed, because that's the way life is. Most of what we publish is lost. But I do believe we need to keep a few original copies of what is, after all, the most influential paper in our history. Just a few. Not everything but one five hundred thousandth of everything. A culture that is able to save locomotives and space capsules and wallpaper collections and gardens full of enormous rusting pieces of sculpture 
and the correspondence of untold numbers of minor historical figures and rare strains of disease germs can, I think, find a way to hold onto something as centrally important as this. Of course, every library and archive and historical society worries about shelf space. Librarians tussle over shelf space within their own institutions. But compared with making digital copies or microfilm copies, space is cheap. It would cost my little nonprofit tens of millions to create digital images of the millions of pages of newspapers it owns in color at a resolution that would allow researchers to read them comfortably. On the other hand, it costs us $26,000 a year to rent the space to keep them safe. As a country, we've really got to do a better job of weighing these relative costs. Drive from Boston to New York and look at the warehouses. There are hundreds of them. Some of them have 50 truck bays. What are they holding? They're holding cheese products, or truck parts, or Happy Meal toys, or Pentium computers that will be scrap in five years. Some of them are for lease. A few big broom clean warehouses would hold everything that our National Library has been sent free by publishers and has rejected every year. Our National Library says that they don't have enough space and they are unwilling to lease space, even though they're willing to budget $94 million for digital projects. Just a little more about space. Last month, I gave a talk at the ribbon cutting ceremony at the new storage facility for the Duke University Library. It's a building like the Harvard Depository, where things are stored in random order, reached by a state-of-the-art cherry picker. The building costs $7.5 million to build, and it will hold 2.5 million books. So a brand new, ultra-cool book building costs only $3 a book to build. A tiny number of the books that are going into that building have been digitally scanned. And here's the salient comparison. To store a 19th century book in this warehouse, it costs $3 a book, plus an estimated 17 cents a book in maintenance and staffing. To scan a 19th century book, it costs at least $100 a book. If you want to scan it in color at high resolution, costs leap up from there. And the physical book doesn't need periodic refreshing on new media and it doesn't need platform migration. It doesn't even need an electrical outlet. Not that it's a bad thing to take digital pictures of books, as long as it's required that the book be cut out of its binding and guillotined. The electric versions can be extraordinarily useful. I'd prefer that book collections were stored in traditional call number order, browsably, which costs a little more, say $10 a book, but the point is that off-site storage, even traditional call number storage, is the cheapest thing you can possibly do to maintain access to a collection. And any scanning or microfilming that big research libraries embark on in the name of remote access should be, from now on, be done with the expectation that the original book go back on the shelf when the copying is done. There's a lot of money for digitization right now. If we set things up so that we tithe 10% into a paper conservancy fund as we digitize to provide for the safekeeping of the originals afterward, we'll be just fine. In fact, at the beginning of a scanned or OCR'd or microfilmed document, it might be nice to read, no originals were harmed in the making of this, of this copy. Research library collections grow. Your children's feet grow and you buy them new shoes. The bigger feet do not re represent a growth problem, but a developmental fact, something to be proud of. For the past half century or more, though, growth has been an embarrassment to some Washington visionaries. They were swept by a kind of Cold War fervor of informational reform, and they wanted all growth to stop. Life would reach a size of a few million volumes, and then the weeding parties would gather and the microcopying would crunch down the excess, and when the microfilm spools themselves took up too much room, then they could microcopy the microcopies at ultra-high resolution and crunch things down more, and the stacks would function like a vast trash compactor, squeezing the words. Because words were squeezable, weren't they? They were disembodied astral presences that had nothing to do with the ink that formed them or the paper that they were printed on or the bindings that held the paper together. They could be reformatted, preserved by being destroyed, because they were immaterial. The books would still exist, they would just not exist. They would be there, but they wouldn't be there. 
You could hold your head high and say you had the finest U.S. newspaper collection in the world, when in fact you'd got rid of 90% of it and replaced it with microphone. What was the source of this thinking? There was one especially influential person some of you may have heard about, most of you may have heard about. His name was Fremont Ryder, head librarian at Wesleyan. Ryder's first book published in 1909 was about the amazing discoveries of spirit wrappings and table turnings and levitation. He felt these things deserved serious study and that the tables did, in fact, turn. He wrote Pulp Fiction. He was the managing editor of the Library Journal. And when he went bankrupt in 1929, after a manic episode in which he spent a small fortune founding a supper club on Long Island, he wrote an indignant pamphlet in which he said that people were fed up with being indebted to banks and they wanted a new deal. He sent the pamphlet to Franklin D. Roosevelt and Roosevelt shot him back a letter with a handwritten note saying, you're right, keep it up. And then a few months later, Roosevelt in his nomination speech pledged himself to a new deal for the American people. So Fremont Ryder was an influential person and his new deal for librarians was this. Make or buy microcopies of your book collection, sell off the book collection to dealers at scrap prices, and you will make, in his words, an actual cash profit on the substitution. You'll enrich your library by getting rid of its books. Ryder got the Librarian of Congress and the Deputy Librarian of Congress and the Head Librarian at Michigan and the Head Librarian at Harvard and other big-time leaders all over the library world to blurb his book and serve on his microcard committee. It's a mathematical fact that book collections double every 16 years, Ryder said. Turns out he was wrong about that. And if we didn't start buying Fremont Ryder's microcard reading machines and selling off the collections, the stacks are going to overrun the entire square footage of New Jersey. Building a storage warehouse was, according to Ryder, a confession of past failure. It was unmanly somehow. This way of thinking continues in some libraries, and it was very powerful in the 1980s when the Library of Congress had high hopes for its optical disk pilot project, which could, according to the deputy librarian, squeeze down the library's three buildings to one. But the optical disk pilot program didn't work out. Nobody uses those big platters anymore. And over the past decade or so, some enlightened library administrators have begun to accept the fact that the easiest way to keep a research collection is to keep the research collection. There's no shame in growth. It's not a confession of failure. Putting up shelves sufficient to hold what's there is the crucially important primary task that research libraries must fulfill. They must do this because no other institutions, public or private, can be depended on to keep these things, the obscure things, the cumbersome things, that even though they're used only once in 10 years or 30 years or 50 years are valuable because they are what people published and read. To a researcher, the fact that something is little used is a positive attribute. If a photo editor for a documentary on, say, Ellis Island pages through the rotogravure section of a newspaper or a forgotten autobiography and finds a picture that has never been reproduced before, she is overjoyed because the picture is interesting and because it's unused. We till around in great collections looking for things that have lain unnoticed. The urge to search through obscurity is basic to scholarship. If the research libraries don't keep it, don't keep copies of the stuff that we as a culture published, nobody else is going to do it. It just won't happen. We can't depend on businesses to save our past. Businesses care about the present and they go out of business. We understand why fragile old flags and old presidential letters are valuable as things. We don't believe that taking a snapshot of Plymouth Rock amounts to a reformatting of Plymouth Rock. And after some long and painful decades of urban renewal, we're doing better with old mills and train stations. Nice postcards, Whistler's Woman in White in museum gift shops, but Whistler's Woman in White is still on the wall. If libraries ask for storage money with the same intensity they ask for digitizing or microfilming money, if they budget it right into the grant proposals for digitization, the public will understand and oblige. We really want you to keep this stuff. Now I want to talk for a last moment about <coughs> conspiracies and personal invective. <laughs> In a well-written piece, previously mentioned, called Don't Fold Up, 
responding to Nicholson Baker's double fold, Richard Cox says several times that I present conspiracy theories in my book. I just don't. I do point out in the book that some of the great library leaders and theorists of the 50s and 60s worked for the CIA and the Department of Defense. But I never use the word conspiracy. <laughs> Joseph Becker, a senior CIA informationalist, designed the Library of the Future exhibits at the Seattle and the New York World's Fair. Herman Fussler, head of the University of Chicago Library, had been the chief librarian of the Manhattan Project, and he was a consultant to the T Atomic Energy Commission. Werner Klapp, the deputy librarian of Congress, and later the founder of the most influential library group, the Council on Library Resources, was a CIA, CIA liaison and consultant for decades with top secret clearance, as were several of the other board members of the Council on Library Resources. Now, when I first stumbled on this, and I was just trying to find out a little more about Werner Klapp, since he was the most influential librarian of the time, I found it all quite fascinating. And I think that there's a lot more work to be done by library historians in teasing out the way that the intelligence community has, in certain eras, hired librarians to help them with their enormous indexing and filing and classifying problems. Obviously, the informational needs of the CIA and the DOD, swift but eyes only movement, instant retrievability, ease of record destruction, are different from the informational needs of someone slowly accumulating research on a particular immigrant neighborhood in Boston in 1906. And for a long time, I believe, intelligence requirements had an undue influence on decision making at some libraries. None of this amounts to a conspiracy, however. Werner Klapp and Herman Fussler were sincere information scientists of a certain stripe who strongly believed that you could reform libraries and win the Cold War at the same time. Finally, about my personal invective. Mostly I simply quote what people say to me, or what they've written. When I disagree with what they say, I say so. The subtitle of my book, Libraries and the Assault on Paper, comes from a passage written by Patricia Batten in 1983, when she says that her university depended on outside funding, this is a quote, and cooperative projects for an active assault on our large collection of brittle materials. I do criticize acts, terrible acts of needless destruction. We were told that the large-scale federal brittle books program begun at the National Endowment for the Humanities in the late 1980s, the plan to microfilm three million books over 20 years, pushed by Patricia Batten and others, was a way of saving the human record. But if you read the planning document on which the Brittle Books program was based, written by the head of the UCLA Library School, you learn that built into the plan was the idea that if one library microfilmed a book, then five libraries could discard their copies of the book, which would amount to a space savings of hundreds of millions of dollars. The Brittle Books program was sold as a kind of emergency book rescue, but it was in fact predicated on book destruction. It's time the public and librarians knew of this inversion of intent. Libraries win or lose the public's trust based on their actions. And the only way we can evaluate the trustworthiness of their actions if, is if we know what the actions are. And yet it is today extremely difficult to find out what libraries like the Library of Congress choose to discard. And so to close, I'd like to recommend that all research libraries that receive public money be required to post lists of proposed discards on their websites. There's a giant hole in the 20th century as a result of the casualties of microfilming projects, but we have a chance to do it right this time around. Offer the boon of networked pages without destroying the riches of local collections. Thank you. Is the slideshow set up? The slide projector? Oh, great. I don't have a thingy. So when I want to switch a slide, do I just say next? <laughs> I want to show you just some slides of, the, of old newspapers because 
because um, I think if I just sit here and say, oh, those papers are beautiful and they're precious and they shouldn't have been thrown out, that's fine. But if, if I show you some pictures of what I'm talking about, you'll be able to judge for yourself whether these things um, have informational value in their illustrations, say, that the microfilm doesn't fully capture. Sorry for the hold up here. Yeah, we'll dim the lights. This is the what the New York world looked like in in the uh, era of rag paper before Joseph Pulitzer bought it. It's only eight pages long because rag paper was extremely expensive. There were periodic rag shortages, and you, they had to jam everything onto these eight pages, so they used very tiny type, and they didn't really have breathing room. Pulitzer and Hearst came to New York City, and they transformed the way people re read the news. And uh, here's the same newspaper in 1898, after the installation of, I think, their second huge printing press. The most marvelous mechanical production of the age was what they called this printing press. And they have an illustration here of the color pages going through it and being cut and folded. And followed by it's something like eight pages of illustration. So this was really the key to the success of these papers was that they were offering a readership color that they hadn't seen before. You could get a whole museum every Sunday for very, very cheap. Uh, Pulitzer and Hearst were competing, and this is an illustration that's also in the book, uh, for, for show the finest battle illustrations in 1898. So here on its side, to take advantage of the full size of the page, is, a, is an illustration with a raking searchlight. And then on the right, you can see the uh, trajectory of a shell that leaves the battleship on the left. And it rises up over a, a column of type in the middle and then lands on the shore on the right-hand side. So they're really thinking about the way the paper looked as a, as a, as a graphic thing. Uh, this muckraking, there's lots of muckraking in, in these turn of the century papers, obviously. This is the problem of sweatshops, the man sewing on the left, the sweatshop owner in the middle, selling to the uh, rich woman on the right. And she's one of the 400. And then this is the same thing on microfilm. This is the New York Public Library's film, which is what everybody's film is made in 1951. And one of the problems is that you have to kind of reassemble it out of eight and a half by 11 printouts. And uh, it's just not the same. Here is a cartoon from 1898. The cartoon pages are incredible. The persecution mania, kind of pre-Freudian uh, uh, thing with the red devils inside. And then on the left, divorced in one Dakota day, it says. And there's a, a man on the left and a woman on the right, and then scenes of vignettes of their divorce, their Dakota <laughs> divorce going through. These newspapers, like the world, have never been indexed. One of the problems is you can't find what's in here because there's no way to find it. And so one of the things I'm hoping to do is to do a kind of modest pilot project indexing the magazine sections of some of the world. Another uh, cartoon, this is the labor-saving dodges for the hot weather, and uh, the man up in the upper left is diving into an automatic undressing machine. This is all pre-Rube Goldberg, but very Rube Goldbergian. On the left, lower left is a robotic lover who takes care of that while the man kind of lounges on the settee. <laughs> this is the same thing on microfilm. Um, you still see the robotic lover. You still see this undressing machine, but you just it just doesn't kind of leap out at you in the same way. Microfilm is a high contrast medium, which means it wants to be either black or white, which uh, in a case of a color illustration isn't ideal.
Uh, this just shows one of the things that the British Library was most scrupulous about. They had to stamp every volume discarded by the British Library or BL canceled. First they were stamping everything in black and some of the stamping was actually obscuring the text so I asked if they could at least use a different color so they resorted to green but then they stamped in this case right in the guy's head boom and then another there and it was uh, this is probably the last remaining page of this that that copy of that illustration certainly in any library the from 1900 to 1930, there isn't any other library, as far as I know, that has the New York world in the original. The American Antiquarian Society has a run of the world through 1900. So fortunately, between the uh, American newspaper repositories run and the American Antiquarian Society's run, there is now one complete run of Joseph Pulitzer's masterpiece. This is uh, the magazine section, which is a huge, full-size, printed on the regular News, pulp newsprint stock um, and every every week there was some illustration this is uh, the, the hazards of a newly electrified New York City all these pictures are from the first decade of the 20th century lots of maps of New York underground always and bridges and they just were they were just seething with pride in this uh, newly powerful city and the newspapers stood for all that <clears throat> New York churches turned into dives, is this one. A boxing match in a, in a church on the lower half. New York's first airship station, I think probably its last. Uh, they had to have airships. There was just a, an obsession with airships, really. An airship every Sunday. This is a, the Greth airship. And this is uh, how, what the, how the eclipse works, kind of a nice one from, I think, 1905 or something. Um, and, and how the Chinese treatment of the eclipse on the lower right. And then the eclipse on microfilm. There is no eclipse on microfilm. Will you tell me when this actually, I think, there. This is a digital photograph, by the way, I can say proudly. <laughs> uh, who gets your money? And it's John D. Rockefeller, Morgan, and Ryan all sharpening their axes as the little guy turns the wheel. And then in the lower left corner, is all, uh, around the perimeter, there are all the products, like shoes and candles and, and railroads and everything, that Morgan, Rockefeller, and Ryan all um, conjointly control. A wonderful conspiracy theory there. How far can New York climb into the sky? And uh, this is a composite illustration of New York's finest buildings, including the Pulitzer Building, which is second from the right, which was torn down in 1954, about the time that the New York Public Library was microfilming that other landmark. Yes, I know. The Sunday Magazine is, shows the uh, heroic rescue of our great firemen showing off the printing press. And then there were lots of fashion pages. Uh, this is a hat. They had to have a hat in every issue as well. Um, and then on the right, Gibson Girl inserts, which were carefully bound in by the British Library um, and are generally don't appear on the microfilm because they're easily stolen. There are many things that don't appear on the microfilm. Whole news sections don't. Because each, each microfilmed set was, was unique in a way. They all were missing things and they all had slightly different editions. And so each one of them is sort of like a, a medieval psalter or something that, that has uh, variations that are interesting. Inside these magazine sections are incredible things. The dumbbell mightier than the corset on the right. Uh, during the New York world, during the first uh, third of the 20th century, the world was really the literary New York paper. And it published uh, Robert Benchley and E.B. White and uh, Dorothy Parker's poem, Men Don't Make Passes at Girls Who Wear Glasses, first published in the world. It was the New Yorker magazine before the New Yorker magazine existed, and yet there is really no run of this thing around, except this one, as far as I know. Hugh is a, a, nice, a nice illustration of a liar. I just 
like that. And then uh, here's an, uh, O. Henry on the lower left had, was a staff writer and had a, a short story in almost every week in the world. And then on the upper left is Norbert Wiener before Norbert Wiener became the famous cyberneticist and war scientist who protested nuclear weapons. And here's on the right is the adventures of a man who dressed up as an Italian tambourine girl and <laughs> wrote about it. On the left is uh, the, the her hazards of being a diver in the docks of New York City. On the right here is a, a man named Leonard who was born without a nose and he wanted a nose very much and so two doctors said that they would give him a nose by sewing his finger to his face and uh, allowing him to uh, have, it, have it heal there, and then they would amputate the finger. Well, Mr. Leonard was okay with this for a while, and then he began to be driven crazy by this finger in his face all day and all night, and so he tore it away. And, uh, but then he decided he would do it again. So they sewed it back, and he tore it away again, and they sewed it, away, sewed it back, and finally he, according to the reporter, left the hospital with the foundations of a new nose firmly attached to his face. Sometimes the things that experts think are the right thing to do are not the right thing to do. Uh, uh, lots, of, lots of plans for the uh, beauties of New York that, to come, and uh, beauties of New York that exist. Of course, there are airships on top. You've got to have an airship. I'm, I'm sorry I'm slow with these. But they hired German, French, Italian illustrators in 1911 to come to New York and illustrate the strangeness of the city. So here's some grotesques that a German illustrator noticed on a rooftop. And here in 1927, a smaller magazine section, Women Raced Chariots in the Hippodrome, latest excavations proof. <laughs> uh, there were many other runs, uh, very rare and beautiful runs of, of immigrant newspapers, all published in the United States, that were part of this uh, discarding program at the British Library, which had the finest foreign newspaper collection anywhere. Irish world from turn of the century. Well, they got it to reverse. The New York Tribune, also, just to show you that there are other uh, papers in this thing, and Recordac, Microfilm of the Tribune, the pale blue, is no longer there. And the Rotogravure sections, which are, are pervasive in all the great newspapers, really through the 40s, um, are printed in much higher resolution on thicker stock. And they're one of the, one of the real losses when you go to microfilm, because they, uh, they just, just lose, you see the sprocket perforation, or markings, but you don't, see the half tones. The New York Forward is another beautiful run that, here's one from 1941. It also has rotogravure sections. And this says, this is the world that the Jewish children of today have inherited in pictures of refugees. I don't think the New York Forward itself has a run of this paper. I don't know what happened there. This is what they looked like when we unwrapped them on pallets. And uh, more beauties, I think, the Greek paper. Um, and the Chicago Tribune also is an incredible thing. The Statue of Liberty holding a fistful of dollars. And their women's sections were in blue ink sometimes. Dinosaurs, of course, got to have those in 1933. And King Carroll with his Paramours, 1933. This is, and Marilyn Monroe in 1950, an early picture of her. And then if you flip that over, Yanks launch offensive, the Korean War. This wonderful feeling that uh, the newspapers offer of simultaneity. Um, moon launched by Reds is how the Chicago Daily Tribune, which was very conservative, described Sputnik. And here's how they, uh, the New York world and some of the forward look now in Rollinsford, New Hampshire, although they should never have left 
England, and here's how we, with David Weaver's help, uh, sorted some of these runs into years. Then each each run is sort of like a whale. It's huge, but um, that when you really add up the amount of space that that a given run of a paper takes, it's it's tiny. I think. I mean, it's it's just not that much. Uh, here is. I'm getting to the end now, and I'm sorry it's taken so long, but here's the, the skyscraper is a modern Tower of Babel, and each one of these little vignettes repays study, 1898. And this is uh, from 1927 again. What will we look like 2,000 years from now? The man sits in a... The man sits in a... Uh, modern looking place, deco, with uh, three radio speakers. You want to do it? And uh, looking out at these kind of minarets, Kremlin-esque minarets. <laughs> and we'll just go to the next slide, how about? What will we look like 2000? 2,000 years from now. Um, well, this is what we're going to look like 2,000 years from now, unless we do a better job of keeping the originals. Thank you very much. to come back. Uh, I, don't, I just should say, I, I don't have any pretty pictures to show. Um, but I, it does remind me, a few weeks ago, I was sitting in my study at home, and I was preparing a talk for another conference. And um, I was, at one point, making an allusion to the Nicholson Baker book. And I decided that in my PowerPoint slide that I would put a photograph of Nicholson Baker there. So I went to the website. He has a fan page. Uh, I don't have a fan page. Um, and, uh, okay, pull, pull the uh, photograph off. And I was putting it into this PowerPoint slide, and my daughter uh, comes into the room, and she says, um, who, who is that? And I said, this is the man I'm debating up in Boston. And she says, mm-hmm. She says, uh, sign me up for that. Uh, just what I want to do, go to a debate with two middle-aged, white-haired, bearded men. And, uh, I should point out that today's her 16th birthday, and for her present, she gets to come up to Boston tomorrow. Okay, so she doesn't have to uh, experience any of this. Okay. <clears throat> At one far distant point, ten, the year 10 million, and Kurt Vonnegut's Sirens of Titan, museum and archives are emptied because they are crowding the living right off the earth. In a million year period, is summed up in a single sentence in the history books. Guy Montag, a fireman in Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 4 Fun, suffers a crisis when he discovers the content of the books he is burning and flees to join with a group who memorizes books in order to protect them from the authorities. Long after a nuclear holocaust, a group of monks uh, discover a sacred uh, text, the shopping list from the pre-war years and a canticle for Leberwitz by Walter Miller. In George Orwell's 1984, Winston Smith contends with a society in which everyone is always monitored and all information controlled by the government. Smith works in the government archives, altering records, and as he develops his own critical notions, purchases a book in order to start keeping a diary. And this, of course, is an unlawful act in that society. Now, these are all classic fictional accounts commenting on post-World War II society's concern with government control of information, the role of books and records in society, the nature of personal knowledge. They are also good stories, also replete with conspiracies, interesting characters, secret societies, humorous societies, and chilling similarities to present events. Now we have another story revolving around misguided government policies well-meaning but hapless characters like Fremont Rider, humorous anecdotes about simplistic procedures and tests, and most of all, 
a vast conspiracy, and I, just as an aside, would can contend, you don't have to use the word conspiracy to convey a conspiracy, involving CIA operatives and those other powerful government agents, librarians. <laughs> However, in this case, the story is true. Or, I'm referring to the book Doublefold that we're talking about today. Instead of television screens in every room repeatedly showing government propaganda films, we have the creation of a widely shown film, Slow Fires, as being part of incessant propaganda by librarians and preservation administrators who have deceived the public into believing that paper becomes brittle and turns to dust. Now, perhaps some may have wondered whether Mr. Baker is playing with us, creating a work just like his you and I, describing a supposed obsession with John Updike, or real, I don't, I don't want to know, in which we must scratch <laughs> our heads and wonder whether we should take Doublefold as fiction or nonfiction. One reviewer of Doublefold called the book resolutely absorbing and indicated that it reads like a spy novel. He is, of course, a witty, witty and charming writer and a superb storyteller. While for some librarians and archivists, at least, he may answer, we need to channel this anger into reading some of our assumptions and most certainly our approaches to how we explain ourselves to the public. <laughs> librarians and archivists, likewise, should use Doublefold as an opportunity to explain themselves, especially as he, Mr. Baker, operates in influential public forums and most librarians and archivists do not have access to those. Um, Nicholson Baker is wrong, mostly, but you need to twist a bit, scratch around in your strongest opinions, and indulge in self-scrutiny to determine just why he is wrong. The pictures are neat, they're neat color photographs, but it's more than just about being neat stuff. Um, <clears throat> and however, and this is a big however, if the public buys Baker's depiction, of libraries and archives, it will be more difficult to meet our mission, any mission, his or ours, because it will be difficult to gather support for what we do. Archivists and librarians obviously need to be careful about how self-reflective we become when reading and responding to Doublefold. As a result of the book, archives, historical manuscripts, rare books, and newspaper collections have become the subject of journalists, book reviewers, and radio and talk show hosts around the country. And many friends and artists may have wondered whether they were the focus of a fictional essay, like Orwell or Vonnegut or Miller or Bradbury. Archivists and librarians are not just in the news, they are the news, thanks in part to his stature as a writer, his celebrity, and his access to publication outlets like The New Yorker. Librarians and archivists are being discussed in publications like The New York Times, Newsweek, the Christian Science Monitor, New York Review of Books, and the list goes on. It grows every day, I think. My stack of reviews and interviews and other materials now beginning to fill a cat pop cabinet drawer. But something is amiss. Librarians and archivists are being attacked in the very area they thought they had gained substantial public support for, the preservation of our documentary heritage. And they're not just being sniped at. They are under major siege. Perhaps one that's just getting started. We are the vandals in the stacks, destroying those precious newspapers before the public gets access to them. We are the slash and burn librarians. We are massacring books in all print. We are gasp biblio bureaucrats, my favorite review. These are all, of course, terms not from the book. Uh, I have other of those terms to use. <laughs> but these are terms from the reviews. It's obvious that Mr. Baker's book is striking at the heart something of, at the heart of something that many feel passionately about, the maintenance of artifacts. But in this, we also discover that the public and Nicholson Baker fundamentally have a poor understanding of, of who and what we are. <clears throat> we can, of course, accept, as he states in his preface, that he is a lover of libraries. For a major literary figure to take the time to write such a book, possibly with far less potential financial gain and distractions from other writing projects, suggests that he has made a commitment to this challenge, uh, to, on this challenge, because he's concerned of the newspaper he is writing about. Now, I'm not actually, I should say as another aside, uh, I'm not sure about the business of selling books. I noticed that I went to Amazon, you know, which runs the little, uh, the, uh, the status of the sales, 
uh, rank. I noticed that double fold is number 577 and the sales rank, whereas my best book and the sales rank is at number 761,769. So um, not only do I not have a uh, fan page on the web, but I seem to be getting slaughtered here in the uh, sales. <clears throat> It is not uh, difficult to believe in his passion for his, call, uh, for his call, since Double Fold reveals that he is not just a fan of those who run library and who makes decisions about preservation and reformatting. Just as librarians long ago discovered that they can convince the public to love books and even libraries, um, but not necessarily understand the professionals who manage them, so Mr. Baker has driven a wedge in between the objects, the books, and the places, libraries, where they are stored and the people, librarians and preservation administrators, who administer them. Perhaps I'm simply being naive. The attention Doublefold has received with its delicious tales of conspiracy and duplicity suggests he really is into a new way to sell books, at least about libraries and archives. In my view, Nicholson Baker does not fully understand the objects of his affection. Uh, at the heart of Doublefold are assumptions about the mission of archives and libraries. Archivists and librarians have been debating their mission for a long time, with librarians wrestling with the roles of their institutions in the information or knowledge or digital age, call it what you want, uh, and archivists struggling with the symbolic or cultural aspects of their mission in relation to the value of records for purposes such as evidence and accountability. Librarians and archivists need to shoulder the blame for not explaining what they do and all of its complexities to the public. They have tended to adopt simplistic messages, and some of this simplicity is evidence in double fold, something most of us would not have worried about until Nicholson Baker started writing about librarians and archivists and their repositories. The public has, in fact, many perceptions of libraries and archives, seeing them as repositories of interesting stuff, documents and artifacts, all of human history, all of human memory and knowledge, or, and simply as one more source of entertainment. Although in this later one, the libraries especially, may be losing out to the super bookstores with their coffee shops, easy chairs, and other diversions. Another weakness of Doublefold is the lack of distinction about types of libraries and the scope of other responsibilities and mandates um, made by Mr. Baker when considering the flight of the pr preservation of the artifacts housed in libraries. Archives are barely figured, really, in, in this book. One does not sense that he understands the difference between archives and libraries, and in fairness, not many outside these disciplines uh, perceive the differences. Certainly not how difficult it would be to scale up the preservation and access challenges posed by the countless unique materials housed in archives and the growing challenges of electronic record keeping systems. Indeed, one might, must acknowledge that he confuses things because when he focuses on libraries, he stresses the role, arguing that librarians' <laughs> primary task is to be paper keepers. This might be true for large libraries like the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, and some major academic, li uh, academic research libraries around the country, but they represent only a fraction of all the libraries in existence. In a discussion about the book, he suggests that he is really only focused on major research libraries and the need for them to keep what they already have on the shelf, ignoring the fact that there are many kinds of research libraries and that many notable research collections are in smaller <coughs> libraries and archival repositories, and that these libraries serve many other and often competing functions, ranging from community literacy programs to community social centers. For most libraries, the kinds of issues uh, that Mr. Baker discusses are out of scope for their daily operation. And when he does mention access, an issue that most librarians are very concerned about, it is limited to the kind of scholarship carried out in the elite academic or major research libraries. Libraries and archives have a much broader scope of concern than the very simple view of the world presented by Nicholson Baker. Archivists are concerned with the constantly evolving notions of records and their supporting technologies, the impact of these technologies and the reliability of records, whether a society immersed in nostalgia and memory will remember to value archival records, whether records will be used in effective ways or even at all, 
and the ethical challenges of managing increasingly complex and sensitive records. Librarians are concerned with how to provide access to a wide spectrum of users to the information in a wide diversity of print, digital, and other resources. Um, censorship, threats to free speech and access to information, and the changing sensitivities to how information sources are e uh, seen and used. And, they, and these are just broad categories of some of the contentious and complex issues we face. Libraries and archives are not just about shelves and warehouses. They are living and often endangered organizations. Managing libraries and archives is difficult. With competing priorities and needs and too few funds to meet all the needs and to solve all the problems. They need funds, staffs, space for organizing and cataloging as well as storage, facilities enabling access and ensuring uh, security, an environment stable. Uh, there is little sense that there are differences between major research libraries and public libraries or between archives and historical manuscript and other repositories of print and documentary resources in Doublefold. Or even that major research libraries have faced substantial challenges in keeping their programs afloat as they try to build and maintain their rare and specialized materials. The notion of saving originals, as he argues, must be weighed against such matters. The irony is that these originals are in the care of all these kinds of repositories. Now, I don't want to the debate to degenerate into merely a matter of I am a professional and he is an amateur. Uh, Americans have loved to take shots at the notion of professionalism as being somehow elitist and anti-democratic. And there are tinges of this throughout the Baker book. Uh, and I must say, this sells books too. And I do not want to raise the specter to cloud the issues being addressed in Double Fall. Yet the essence of being an expert is in mastering a specialized body of knowledge and of using that knowledge for a public good. While he argues that there is a breach of trust between the public and librarians and archivists, Doublefold makes its arguments without fully knowing what librarians and archivists do. He does not understand the distinction between librarians and archivists. He notes, for example, that a true archive must be able to tolerate years of rel relative inattention neglecting to reflect on the fact that archives must be carefully monitored to ensure that mold, rodents, and other problems do not attack those, those precious paper documents or that archives are dealing with electronic record keeping systems requiring intervention at the point of their creation and design and considerable monitoring and use thereafter. And even more importantly, such a view, view fails in understanding that archives are repositories of evidence ensuring accountability and building and sustaining a societal memory. In other words, archives become places of relative inattention at the peril of the loss of essence of what makes community, government, and nations. He also expresses no concern about such matters, perhaps because he has another cause or focus. For the public, newspapers are old records, and old records must be what archivists are caring for behind their walls. In this sense, libraries and archives are like museums. Really? In an interview, he, when asked about the role of the university li research library, he stated that the job of the research library is to keep the stuff that people read. And that's a very simple task. Notice, he believes this is a simple task. Yet the increasing scholarship on reading notes how difficult it is to determine who has read, read what, or even if something has been read at all. If a research library only kept what, kept what people read, they would be very small places. <laughs> And the shelves were rarely, if, rarely if all consult, at all consulted. The shelves would be filled with multiple copies of popular novels, how-to manuals, dummies and idiots guides, self-help publications, and other similar currently popular materials that might not be popular or even consulted in the future because they're designed, like our computers and other electronic devices, to have short lifespan. So what is he going after in his book and his crusade? <clears throat> Archivists and librarians can't afford to be dismissive or condescending of the paper profit that has aris risen in their midst. He already has his followers, all those people glued to the television set every week, watching <laughs> Antiques Roadshow or submitting their bids on eBay. He also has some supporters from within the library and archives communities who believe that paper is the most stable medium by which to maintain documents and information 
or evidence found in those sources. <clears throat> there is certainly some truth in this kind of argument, but this is very different, I believe, than the exaggerated case that he has built over the past few years. Reading his book reminds me when I asked a friend about the movie on Ike and Tina Turner's lives and careers released a few years ago. My friend, re friend reflected for a moment and summarized the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It, in case those of you want to go to the video store later, summarized the movie this way. Ike, Ike was very, very bad, and Tina was very, very good. <laughs> for Nicholas and Baker, librarians, except for those who agree with him, are very, very bad. Although libraries are very, very good. After a reading Doublefold, one might also wonder, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> the so-called information age has done weird things to us regarding how we perceive information and its value. Perhaps Doublefold is merely a product of this strange time, when we seem to be straddled between print and digital information, between an interest in the, tac the tactile pleasures of artifacts and the convenient but certainly sterile uses of information via keyboard and screen. On the one hand, technologists keep dreaming up ways to preserve everything, some even seeing religious significance in their work. The premise, everything should be saved. The information age has thrown librarians and archivists into a spin about what they need to be doing. Librarians are being asked to be information professionals. Can librarians do this and also preserve all those originals? Archivists work under a mission to identify, preserve, and make available for use records of continuing value. And this continuing value encompasses the maintenance of records for accountability, corporate or social memory, and evidence all to benefit and protect citizens. Can archivists only accomplish this by preserving originals? Maybe Nicholson Baker is really worried about something else, and it is a concern that certainly any author has sympathy for. Perhaps he is worried that in 50 or 100 years, his writings, his books, won't be on the shelves of libraries or bookstores or in the memory banks of computers that might be supporting the roles of libraries and publishers. I remember in a conversation some time ago about the odd moments in Ray Cudswell's book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, as he wistfully wrote about immortality being in reach via an injection of our consciousness into the computer's hard drives. A colleague swallowing his mouthful of food, you can only have these discussions over lunch, uh, kindly surmised that Cudswell, who he knew, was beginning to think about his own mortality. Perhaps Nicholson Baker is worried that his writings will not outlast him very long, although he obviously has a better shot of it than I, <laughs> of mine, especially as he views libraries and archives being selective in what they preserve. Indeed, I know some librarians and archivists who are already testing the durability of double folds construction and lamenting that Random House printed the book on acid-free paper. <laughs> That, that was a cheap shot, but <laughs> could, could resist. Why, why can't librarians and archivists preserve all this stuff and keep it in its original forms? Well, it seems they should be able to do this because librarians and archivists have been very, very busy, it seems. Double Folds focuses on what has been done in libraries and archives, although the emphasis is on libraries and books and newspapers, specifically the use of microfilming and the subsequent destruction of newspapers and books for their reformatting in order to preserve their content. Microfilm has been a poor choice, resulting in poor copies and leading to the massive destruction of books and newspapers. His colorful language suggests that these libraries and other institutions have produced a historical record, record compromised and dis disfigured, a clean out of the libraries, a strip mined history. Uh, it's not a, Doublefold is not a mere uh, critique of the preservation methods of librarians. Instead, it looks for a conspiracy and finds it. Uh, perhaps he is sincere in his convictions or simply frustrated with all the hyperbole about the preservation mandate, or maybe he knows the conspiracy sell better. Would a book critiquing library and archives preservation minus the conspiracy be featured on the pages of the leading newspapers and book review outlets? Probably not. Its face would be to exist as an internal document discussed and debated deep within the professional journals and conferences with a sales forecast measured in the hundreds. He may have given us the opportunity and motivation, indeed the absolute necessity, to speak out in a much more public forum, 
not merely as advocates for a particular position, uh, uh, but as explainers of complex and difficult uh, responsibilities faced by librarians, archivists, and preservation administrators. There are weaknesses in this book, and they may prove the weakness, weaken, weaken his purpose. The most obvious is his invective against those he sees as responsible for the debacle he insists has happened. He repeatedly mentions the incessant library propaganda foisted on the public, clearly arguing that they lied, and just importantly, tried to conceal the evidence of their misdeeds. Those of us who have been interested in teaching and reaching the public about the necessity of preservation of books and archives have probably viewed this preservation advocacy as major exemplary successes. He argues that the architects of this preservation movement have been secretive, like weapons procurer, procurers at the Department of Defense. Uh, and his constant references to the CIA, federal funding, and even some of those people who work at tobacco companies and, and other features of the preservation movement all seem rather silly. <coughs> what is missed is, of course, that the entire foundation of the information science field and computer industry was built in this time under similar circumstances. Are we participating in a conspiracy every time we use a co computer to write an essay, send an email message, or look for information on the web? He's not a Luddite, and he uses computers, as does his publisher. So I submit he also was part of grand conspiracy, hatched deep in those secret rooms in the Pentagon. And given that the post-World War II plans for that building was to turn it into a federal record center, I know that the tentacles of this conspiracy are long. <laughs> if this sounds silly, so does the connecting of the use of microfilm in libraries and archives to a breach of public trust in libraries and archives and the preservation communities. He levels serious charges, library administrators according to him, have not been doing their jobs. Participating in a slow betrayal of an unknowing nation and destroying whatever trust the public should have had in them. Most importantly, he goes after the brittle books effort, berating <coughs> both the notion of brittle and the idea that books were going to turn into dust and the crisis produced by the problem. Where is, he asked, the predicted apocalypse of paper? He may be way too creative a writer for his own good when he tries to figure out how and why these decisions were being made. Perhaps his must, next book might be a diatribe against the entire advertising industry because it seems that he's mostly upset that librarians pushed the program that has been reasonably successful in reformatting newspaper books and other traditional print resources that seemed endangered and that he sees some evidence for being somewhat exaggerated. exaggerated. Ultimately, his anecdotal descriptions of books declared to be brittle a decade before that are still found to be existing and worse that turn up with deaccession marks and command hefty prices as collectibles really miss the point that not all books are worth saving, that market prices, which are hardly rational, should play a minor role in the preservation efforts and that libraries and archives have other priorities and limited funds while, and, and limited support. While the great collectors assembled collections that became major additions to research libraries and archives, much of what now passes for collecting is driven by a commodities approach with interest only in monetary values. How many people buy a rare book and read it? Probably as many as buy a rare, rare wine and drink it. <laughs> These are often investments and as such, they are hardly evidence of some breach of faith and a covenant between librarians and the public. Now there are various flavors in the concoction of double fold. At times, one gets a sense of well-intentioned but misguided decision-making operating within libraries. He mentions that librarians were involved in impetuously technophilic decisions and often operated within a, few, a full futuristic swing. What librarians and what libraries? Well, yes, we know that they replace card catalogs with online public access catalogs. But that despite his pleas that civilization was ending with the loss of those printed, handwritten, and sometimes <coughs> crude catalogs, most individuals seem pleased to have enhanced access to libraries across the world. These libraries bet too much on what microfilm would do for them and how well it would work. More often, however, the librarians in Doublefold come across as evil or as dupes or just plain stupid. The source of the book's title, 
the test long used for determining how brittle a book's pages may be, is a good example of how he approaches the subject. Seeing it as an instrument of deception, almost always of self-deception, to be used by no one with any real intelligent, intelligence because it is intended to tell administer, administrators precisely what they want to hear. The fold test has become, become an easy way for libraries to free up shelves with a clear conscience. The double fold test is, in his words, utter horseshit and craziness. Good sound bite. And incidentally, I tried to title my, my review that the SAA published, Utter Horseshit and Craziness. <laughs> they, they, they indicated to me that there are a lot of nuns who are members of the Society of American Archivists that they suggested a different title. Um, so much for literary creativity. Yet the truth is that millions of books were printed on poor paper. And the fact that Mr. Baker can find some that still seem to have left, life left in them is nice, but not very convincing. We can amass thousands of counterexamples and evidence that demonstrated that repeated use of books and newspapers might be their last use. And some of us in this room, perhaps, have experienced this. Now, no one will acknowledge that mistakes were made, uh, uh, will not acknowledge that mistakes were made with microfilm, especially in producing poor images. We saw examples. Or even that some of the arguments for preservation decisions were overstated. But it is one thing to criticize and note problems, and quite another to denounce the intentions of what librarians and archivists were doing. At present, there are rigid technical standards in place for microfilming and preserving paper. And the existence of these standards may be the result of learning from the earlier mistakes. If he intended for his essays and books to help us to con continue to learn and to make adjustments, its tone and message seem counterproductive. Librarians or archivists can hardly expect to embrace a plot line in which they are the villains. Librarians and archivists select, provide access, organize and catalog, preserve, promote their services, and manage increasingly complicated and diverse operations, all in the face of a lack of resources, lack of public understanding, rapidly changing technologies, societal debates and controversies, changing constituencies, internal professional debates, and new demands for services. The public may not fully understand what libraries and archives do, but they often expect services from them that stretch their resources. While Mr. Baker focuses his book on the single function of preservation, as if, as if this is all libraries and archives are about, librarians and archivists have had to respond to rising expectations that everything will be made available through digitization. Preservation and access are linked, so the focus of Doublefold on the maintenance of originals and cheap warehouse space in out-of-the-way places is somewhat misplaced. Doublefold takes one particular test and makes it the centerpiece of a grand conspiracy. And again, I submit the language is the language that suggests a conspiracy. Baker really believes that the entire preservation movement, or it seems to suggest that the entire preservation movement, seems to believe that the entire preservation movement of the past couple of generations has been part of an effort merely to show, save shelf space, an argument he repeats at every available opportunity. The newspaper microfilming has, according to him, drained beauty and color and meaning from the landscape of the knowable. And again, we saw the pictures demonstrating this view. And the emergence of the Biddle, Brittle Books program was part of an effort to divert attention away from the obvious failures in microfilm. He makes it all sound so plausible and so bad. He even ignores the fact that many of these librarians and archivists are scholars in their own right making judicious decisions in the face of difficult circumstances, and nearly all are experts building on the hard scrabble of experience. Mistakes may be made, but they are not being made as a result of some vast conspiracy, ignorance, or malfeasance. The fundamental weakness of the argument may be, in his belief, more implicit than explicit, that everything can and must be saved in its original state. At times, it seems that he communicates that he simply wants one copy of everything that has already been acquired by certain research libraries kept in its original pristine condition in these repositories. But I am not sure that there is fundamentally much difference in the scale he is considering from that of just saving everything. Both seem impossible. How, for example, could such a vast coordination of delegating responsibility 
among thousands of libraries and archives, for millions and millions of books, newspapers, and other materials take place. As an archivist, this is my concern with the book and with the reviews and the interviews and the publicity. Baker wants these newspapers in the original because the size of the typical newspaper is important, because microfilm projects um, usually do not capture all the various editions many urban dailies produce. We need every edition of every newspaper. Now in the book, that's what's said. Okay, I haven't found the reference again, but that's what's stated. Um, he vents frustration that microfilm, at least in its heyday, was filled with a link with destruction and with the befuddling divergence, that's the quote, between conservation and preservation, where one involves saving originals and the other their destruction. He wants the paper saved because he believes that we need to study the physical history and durability of early wood pulp paper. <coughs> Archivists know, however, that saving every item is not possible. We can't even examine all the records. And the archivists and their allies have been developing selection schemes and strategies for years as a means to cope with such challenges. Even if we chose to treat original newspapers, there is still the matter of financial and other resources required that makes this less an option um, than, Nick, than Nicholson Baker seems to, able to understand, perhaps because the book's message would have to become more complex. Making an argument that everything should be saved is a powerful one and it's easier to make than trying to wrestle about with who will have responsibility for selection and what criteria will be used. Now, the one true hero in Doublefold, and I looked for a hero, I knew there had to be one somewhere, okay, seems to be the bibliographer and print scholar, G. Thomas Tanzel, who knows that all books are physical artifacts without exception, just as all books are bowls of ideas. So save it all. Yes, books are content and manufactured object, information and sometimes art, propaganda and commodity. This certainly suggests the need for us to keep originals of books, but it does not necessarily imply that we save all books so that we can scale this up to encompass something like newspapers. Not everything of value to some scholar far distant in the future, maybe, can be saved for posterity. <laughs> Librarians and archivists must make choices, hard as this might seem. And this is complex. Yes, some scholarship requires original artifacts. But what about other challenges, such as the digitally born objects and record systems and the other research and purposes served by records that extend far beyond the scholarship on books, printing, and other related matters? Government archives are saving records to ensure accountability so that we know that Bill Clinton gave to Monica a copy of a certain book written by the person sitting next to me. We need to know these things. Corporate records management programs are administering record keeping systems to ensure legal and regulatory compliance. The world, at least that for libraries and archives, may be a bit more complex than what Nicholson Baker knows or cares to consider. Archivists know that saving everything is simply impossible. Yet this point of Baker's may be what has the most resonance with the public. Because as one reviewer stated, nothing beats the original. He point, Mr. Baker pleads that we leave the books alone, and alone, and alone, and alone. I think that's exactly how it's said. And by the time we, you finish the book, or listen, finish listening to him, you might agree. But consider the weakness of this. Just letting everything accumulate and leaving it there in its original form assumes that libraries and archives do not make selections to begin with. Baker constantly focuses on the Library of Congress as serving as a repository for all printed copyright books. That there are not accidents and catastrophes that weed out such natural accumulations, or that many, most, books and archives will not be used for decades or more, or perhaps not used at all. We cannot keep everything, and merely trying to do so weakens our ability to keep anything. Regardless of what some might argue, not every book, pamphlet, newspaper, or document is important enough to merit perpetual care. Do we have to keep an original copy of Doublefold? Do we have to keep an original copy of one of my books? I, I don't think so. And libraries, librarians and archivists, even if they were just in the business of running warehouses, could not store everything or even a substantial portion of everything published or created. Well, I'll share some simple
estimates that deserve to be answered, the problem with his estimates is that he does not factor in all the resources or kinds of resources that would be needed. Specialized staff, adequate storage facilities, not just warehouses, adequate storage facilities, reading rooms, equipment for copying, and other similar items and functions are not considered in the pages of Doublefold. His libraries are simpler places than they are or ever have been in the real world. And in addition, what some are calling history, the, the, double, the, the some are calling double-folded history, perhaps because it has footnotes, describes many procedures, policies, and processes that date back many years and that have been corrected, updated, or replaced with better approaches. It is, not just, it is just as likely that what we have experienced over the past half century, both successes and failures, have prepared us for new approaches that, that might not have come into play if we had not stumbled about looking for and experimenting. While one might easily interpret from double fold, librarians and archivists should proceed with caution, especially as future technologies might help resolve some of the challenges of preserving originals. The lesson not appreciated is the complexities of the responsibilities faced by librarians and archivists. Nicholson Baker and double fold needs and deserves responses that re-examine the scientific evidence for brittle paper. There is scientific evidence. The history of microfilming and brittle book programs, both what they have accomplished and the failures. The responses of researchers and other users, especially considering the use of microfilm newspapers and the use of original papers. The economics of preservation and libraries and archives in general. The need for and types of selection criteria for devoting ex extraordinary resources to preserving particular originals. The need for and effectiveness of preservation and conservation education and numerous <coughs> other issues. We need to respond carefully to the many levels of his arguments and his arguments are complex and comprehensive. Perhaps it would not be a bad idea to call a moratorium briefly on the major reformatting project. So we can discuss these issues do some study, consider the options, and at the least, why not divert some of the millions of federal and foundation funding to study some of the kinds of questions that he has raised? Or perhaps he could help us tap into the foundation funding sources that he needed to support his own newspaper archive. And yes, it is ironic that the criticisms he makes about the external government funding to support the insidious microfilming and brittle books projects does not direct attention to the responsibilities of newspaper and book publishers for creating generations of cheap, poorly manufactured, and ephemeral objects. Why target librarians and archivists who have been stuck with these objects rather than their manufacturers, expressly since the former, because of their campaigns, have managed to get better products? Why target librarians and archivists when they are the ones trying now to work with the computer hardware and software manufacturers so that better, more durable ebooks and digital record systems are available. Study and careful analysis is what we need, not unsubstantiated charges. Is it an exaggeration that brittle book will literally brittle paper will literally turn books into dust? Of course. So what? Baker provides a lot of anecdotal evidence, mostly from his own personal experience and observation. Some of it quite compelling and intriguing. But we need to examine in an analytical, if not scientific, fashion the extent of deterioration of paper. While it appears that the proponents of reformatting books and newspapers may have overstated their case, Baker surely has overstated his. Preserving original newspapers across the world does seem excessive unless undertaken as a very selective exercise. Do some researchers complain about using microfilm? Yes. Again, so what? I've talked to archivists who tell me of patrons complaining about having to use original newspapers. So I and others can also compile such anecdotal evidence on the other side of the argument as well. A minor theme in this book, although no less emotional or intense, is the role of education in the crisis he is describing. And it seems appropriate here to discuss this a little bit. Baker muses over the fact that the book conservator the one most likely to save the original artifact must go through a slow apprenticeship while the preservation administrator, the one making those reformatting decisions, quote, 
needs but an extra year of library science courses to earn the right to decide or help decide what to do with a stack full of artifacts about which he or she might know almost nothing, end of quote. Another point he asserts, there is a direct correlation between the spread of preservation administration as a career and the widening toll in old books. Now, most of us have operated on a different level uh, per regarding preservation, assuming the main problem was that there were too few trained preservation administrators out there in the first place. <clears throat> of course, adopting his argument that we should just leave the books in the stacks and not bother with them suggests eliminating the education that we already have in place. I do believe we have a major educational venture before us, but not mer merely in retraining new kinds of preservation administrators, but in explaining to the public and policymakers the nature of library and archival preservation. We also need to be able to educate our friends, too, people like Mr. Baker, who declare that they love libraries and archives. Now, in the interest of time, I have another dozen pages that I was going to talk <laughs> about the selection of newspapers. Let's skip over because I do believe that some of the examples that we've seen up here, that there are cases that we do need to preserve certain original newspapers. But in a highly selective and very careful process, the highest selective way, very careful process, and not all newspapers. Again, the examples in double fold are always focused on um, certain kinds of major newspapers. But we know that there are thousands and thousands of dailies out there. We also know that the U.S. Newspaper Project um, it, it was not just involved in newspaper microfilming, but in amazing effort to gather the bibliographic information about the complexities of the newspapers that are out there that again is not reflected. Again, because there is a disconnect between the notion of preservation and access in the book, and I think in the arguments that we know that are, are quite vital. But I'm not going to obviously use up the time. Let me just skip to my last page and a half here uh, uh, and uh, end it, and then open it up for, uh, well, whatever's going to happen next. <laughs> I notice that there's no door behind us. I'm worried. In effect, okay, this is the conclusion. In effect, Nicholson Baker's writings are a lament about the loss of an older sensibility, older sensibility to original materials, one generated by our immersion into an acceptance of copies via the internet or wide web, and that he and others worry may have dulled our senses about the value of original objects. His article and his book are much like the worry of Swen Burkitt's about the demise of both the printed book and linear reading. However, one can, can believe in the continuing utility of print and the value of maintaining books and some newspapers in their original condition while recognizing that the ultimate preservation demands requires mechanisms like microfilming and digitization projects. There is need for both. I love books. I have about three or 4,000 in my own library. I love books, too. There is, well, I don't have any newspapers, though. <laughs> there, there is no conspiracy or even tragic problem with our libraries and archives, other than the fact that they have immense challenges and limited resources. He might think of himself as a Greek hero, calling others to join in his epic quest to save America's past. But at best, he will only save a minuscule portion, and perhaps even divert the public's attention from the greater issues facing the preservation of the books, documents, newspapers, and other artifacts of the past. He reminds me, unfortunately, of Sisyphus. What all of this leads up to is the need to use the same standards for evaluating his book that he himself employs to evaluate preservation efforts of the past half century. He critiques the film, Slow Fires, in this fashion. It would be a better film if what it was saying happened to be truth and not head-slapping exaggeration, then its use of crisis language would have some justification. This applies, the same, the same applies, of course, to determining, determining just how exaggerated double-fold may be. Certainly, he thinks a crisis also exists. I think the exaggeration comes in his characterization of some individuals and the more conspiratorial aspects of his argument. The truth rests somewhere in his arguments about the price of microfilming and digitization of books that may not be as endangered as we were led to believe. But there is an awful lot of superfluous chit-chat, speculation, and conspiracy theorizing 
to dig through in order to find the kernel of that truth. Thank you. like to open the floor now to questions from uh, those. There are two people with microphones. Is there someone else? Uh, if you guys don't mind sort of alternating between that mic for the moment, oh, sure. should we look at okay. um, Anybody like to start? Not a single hand. <laughs> Did someone actually say that? Hi, both of you talked about trust and the issue of trust uh, between the public and libraries. And so the question that I have for Mr. Baker is, um, is, is the point that uh, libraries need to be held to a higher standard of trust? We need to raise a level of accountability. Or is the point that there was a level of trust that has been breached? And if it's the latter, could you give us examples of what you've been able to find that were actual statements of some evidence of trust? whether it's covenant, legal contract, policy, it doesn't matter, but what, what can we really point to as a measure of a statement of an obligation that, uh, that, that, that we really need to, to, to look to when we critique behavior and action? I think the thing that I uh, became indignant writing the book was because I, when I found, I think the Brittle Books program was presented to us and presented to many librarians as a way of saving the human record. And, and so what I did was go back and read the actual documents, the, the cost-benefit analysis on which this program was based. And in reading them, it turns out that the number one benefit to it is space savings. And that if you microfilm these endangered, at-risk, and brittle books as diagnosed with the variations on the fold test, that you will then allow libraries to liberate five times that number as a result of the, um, the fact that that microfilm exists. And I don't think that that was disclosed to Congress or to the public. And that that, that is not, it's not that, that, that there was any kind of contractual obligation or anything, it's that I don't know that we would have supported with such a feeling of anguish this idea that our civilization was turning to dust if we knew that the people who were saying this so compellingly were in fact intending to guillotine and throw out all those books. I just don't think we would have done it. Now it may be that, we, it may be that there's a legitimate point to be made that, they, they, that we should have done it, but it should have been disclosed in that way, that, that the guillotining and throwing out and the somewhat indiscriminate use of the so-called vacuum cleaner approach, you, taking a whole collection rather than making individual choices in the, in the interest of speed, was part of, the, was part of the plan. If we had known that, we, we, and this is, I guess, my general point, is I think we need to know more about what's going on. Because the more knowledge that we have, the more likely it is that people like me who feel that things went seriously awry, that there was lots and lots of money it was spent on things like diethyl zinc. The quote from here from weapons procurers of the department, like that the librarians were behaving like weapons procurers of the Department of Defense. Well, that sounds like I'm some kind of nut saying that. But actually, this, this program of using a, a, a gas that explodes on contact with water and bursts into flame on contact with air over three decades at the Library of Congress, when its military uses were never revealed, and which cost millions and millions of dollars, could, could, might not have happened if we had known that there was, was this kind of secrecy, and that we, if we could have used that money, and it's always about money in some ways, to, to store the stuff that was at the same time being guillotined and thrown away, who, people like me wouldn't be making a fuss. Yes, uh, my qu question's for Richard. Um, I have experience of this 30 years in the National Archives. I found many instances where um, either 
congressional oversight people or as the archives was part of GSA were urging microfilming and destruction. And I guess uh, from that experience, I find this book very refreshing. And um, it does seem to me that this is a, a concern that archivists and librarians should be concerned with uh, because often the budget uh, numbers are what dictate um, professional decisions. I'm not sure what the question is then. What's, what's the issue? That microfilm is being pushed on you? I, I, no, I guess um, you see this move on very compelling and I think as archivists and librarians we should be very concerned uh, that these are, are legitimate issues and that we should welcome uh, the book rather than be critical of it. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, I'm not saying dismiss the book, and I'm not saying it's not compelling. It is a very compelling read, and the fact that um, every time we pick up a newspaper or, you know, read one of our listservs, we find yet another review, or we find him being interviewed. I read The Atlantic Unbound, where you were trying to backtrack from the conspiracy uh, notions of uh, uh, interview and some other things. Um, uh, you know, I mean, yes, it is a compelling book and it is something we need to take seriously. I don't think it should be dismissed. However, I also don't think we should welcome it with welcoming arms. I think we need to basically look at what are the elements in there that are incredibly uh, ne necessary for us to deal with and what are those that are wrong? And there are a lot that are wrong. Uh, one of the assumptions is that a lot of what we do is about warehouses. Um, there is the quote in the Atlantic on unbound thing about, you know, you go out on I-95 and you see warehouse after warehouse after warehouse, uh, America's ingenuity of building warehouses. They're not the warehouses that we need. They are not the warehouses that we need. For God's sake, we can't even get the people who are supposed to know how to build libraries and archives buildings to put in the right kinds of environmental conditions. They continually prepare <laughs> structures that are inadequate for our purposes. And if you put those newspapers in those warehouses, the paper will deteriorate even more quickly because of the environmental conditions. It is a compelling book. We need to take it seriously. I agree 100%. But it is not all true. It is, it, there are simplistic notions in there. And there are things that we need to deal with. Now, I've been writing for 20 years about the issue of selection, appraisal, being the critical issue okay, for librarians and archivists. And one thing I will agree with some of the things in the book is the indiscriminate nature of some of the ways that the brutal, the digitization even, or the <coughs> microfilming and the brutal books projects have been taken about. First article I ever wrote uh, about, um, from an archival viewpoint, cr critiquing preservation selection was 1986. So I'm very much invested in this and, and, and think that the preservation community has made faulty, has been very poor and elaborating in selection criteria as well. I think the library community as well. So yes, we need to be better. And we, we do need to explain ourselves. Um, what I regret is that now we are in the defensive, not having necessarily just to explain ourselves, but also having to defend ourselves, okay, in a time of precarious funding. I mean, with a new administration that perhaps is going to gut funding um, from existing programs. We already have seen the National Historical Publications and Records Commission budget, which is virtually non-existent to begin with. I remember 20 years ago, sitting in a living room, a friend of mine who was a submarine commander, who told me that, he, he told me one time of going out on exercise and losing a submarine, um, losing, they lost the torpedo. Okay, I won't mention the name or the, uh, the ship that the, the boat that this occurred on, but they went out and lost the tor torpedo. So I said, we were having a debate about federal support of parts versus the military. I said, what did that torpedo cost? He said, $2 million. This is 20 years ago. I said, at that point, that's the whole budget for NHPRC support for historical record. So one of the problems we have in the context of this book is the fact that um, it, there's a part of an unreal world here that exists, as if it's our choice necessarily always to go out and just make these decisions, as if we have unlimited resources and unlimited support. We don't, and the preservation program fought for a very long time. And because of those successes, that book is printed on uh, acid-free paper and has a better chance of surviving because of those successes with some of the same crazy people. And look, I know some of those people named in that book, 
and they are odd. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm not going to deny it. They are strange, odd people to deal with, okay? Um, I may be strange and odd to deal with. There are people here who know me that will probably sit there and say, yes, okay. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they were wrong in some of the things that they were doing, or that because they worked for this agency or did that, that there's something that's wrong. So yes, I mean, if we're being pushed to do things, we need to do a better job explaining what it is that we do. A uh, question for Mr. Baker with a follow-up. Have you used your newspaper collection for research purposes in the past year? Uh, the students from the University of New Hampshire, as part of a history class, uh, came to both sort the papers, and then they were given the assignment of using, of picking an individual year. And so they worked with a given volume of the Chicago Tribune and the New York Herald Tribune, and that will continue next year. Another kind of use is McGraw-Hill is publishing a textbook of, um, of one of its big textbooks, and now a website goes along with it. And some consultants hired by McGraw-Hill to produce this website are having trouble with the microfilm of the Chicago Tribune because it, it, it isn't very, it just doesn't look good on the web or in person. And so they came to me wanting to look at, at the Chicago Tribune volumes and then I showed them some stuff from the New York world, and they found all these incredible political cartoons. So now, as part of this website, there will be all, uh, this thematic study of the meat packing legislation, Upton Sinclair, 1906, with all the political cartoons related to that. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I would hope would happen. It's not that this place is going to be overrun with people who, who use this when they could be using um, microphone, because it is the paper is delicate and, and it's one of a kind and important to keep it safe. But it just seems to me that there are kinds of uses and kinds of questions that only the originals can answer and that's why you would want a, a, a low use newspaper collection like this. Um, and I hope that will continue. Not hearing a number, but how do you respond to a librarian who would choose to decide to take, I think the figure was $26,000 a year for warehouse space. Mm -hmm. And rather than use that $26,000 for the purpose you just described, use it to run uh, children's story hour programs or adult literacy programs or other types of programs. Um, my point being that it mightn't be about shelf space, mm -hmm. but about the best possible use of a resource to benefit the most number of people. Well, really, my book is about and I do apologize if that, if that in some way, I, 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 that my, uh, my, my discussion of the actions of places like the Library of Congress has seemed to apply to small suburban public libraries which have a very different function. And of course, one book coming into one of those places dislodges another book. But at places like the Library of Congress, <coughs> there really was a huge amount of money spent on things, like diethyl zinc deacidification, and like microfilming, and like optical disc pilot projects, none of which worked. They were, there was money that just went out the door. And I think it was because the library's senior management was just wandering, and they were, were excited by things that were divergent from what I think is the goal of a place like the Library of Congress, which is not, in that case, children's story hours and things, but the holding on to the accumulated intelligence of this country. <laughs> Can I just say one thing about that? I mean, about the small, the big research libraries versus the small libraries. I mean, I, I tried to make that point. Maybe I didn't make it well enough. The fact of it is, is that many research collections are also held by small repositories. Newspaper, many newspaper collections are, are also held by small repositories. That's the U.S. Newspaper Project, when it goes out there, finds thousands of newspapers, in some cases unknown, Okay, in those kinds of small repositories. So I think that whether intended or not, that book is being re read as a indictment, criticism, however you want to characterize it, of all libraries and all archives. Okay, that's 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 what it's that's based and and in fact I think it you know it, these in smaller institutions do have a role to play in, in this stuff. It's not just about the Library of Congress. I mean, except that the Library of Congress 
I talked to somebody at the Library of Congress. They said if we preserved the original newspapers every year, we would have to have 50,000 bound volumes of newspapers every single year. There's the, I don't know who this person is. I haven't checked up on this, but the, some of you saw the letter to the, to the um, New York Times. The Library of Congress started replacing newsprint with microfilm in 1961. Storing all those newspapers for 40 years, much less than a century, would cost $100 million. Last year, the library spent $1.1 million in microfilm, 3.7 million newspaper pages. So Baker's <coughs> figures are off by nearly $100 million. I, I, again, I don't know who this person is. I mean, this is, I mean, and to be honest, we need to sit down and look at those figures and, 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 and figure it out. But it's not as, I, I think there is a huge cost and a huge set of problems that need to be scaled up that are not reflected in this argument. Could I just say one thing about the, the, the repeated thought that I, I, I say that librarians are evil and that librarians are villains and the only hero of this book is, uh, is Thomas Tansel. Well, I actually use the word heroic librarians about um, people like Charles Longley of the Boston Public Library, Lucy Caswell of the Ohio State uh, Cartoon Research Library, Peter Waters, who spent his career at the Library of Congress. He's you know, one of the great book <coughs> conservators of all time. Randy Silverman at the University of Utah, who's the preservation administrator there. Paul Conway at Yale. These are all people who talked to me and told me that things had gone wrong that really troubled them and that it was important to get some of these things out. And I, I mean, when, when, I, when I said that something was called slash and burn preservation, the reason why I said it, it was in quotation marks because it's from a paper by Paul Conway who said that it's very difficult to evaluate the quality of, of uh, the copy of, a micro, of the originals of the microfilm versus the copy when the originals are in a landfill. Okay, that's, that is the thing that he wrote. So something bad happened there that we have to look at, I think, and we have to learn from. And we really, it's right now, we're right on the cusp of something where it's very profitable to learn from that, those mistakes because there's so much money and so much excitement about digital scanning. And we can really, we could do it right this time. Instead of having, using JSTOR to replace every single journal run in one's own institution, one could say, well, these journal runs are, of course, it's useful to have JSTOR and be able to search through things, but these things are part of what we have, part of the history of our own institution, and we should value them as well. So I think it's worth okay. holding on. I think um, what I'd like is maybe more comment than a question, but it is all about money, I agree, and there is never enough of it, but it seems to me unfortunate that we're using this as such an adversarial type of commentary. Um, this book has really brought to the forefront the fact that there isn't enough money. Librarians have made choices, maybe choices that we wish we hadn't made in hindsight. Certainly I found the color uh, slides very compelling. And I'm wondering if there isn't some way we could use this as a, a springboard toward common ground, which is to say that if we had more public funding, we could save more of, of the treasures that in the past have been thrown away and would have been thrown away if some of these uh, volumes hadn't been saved. So I'd like to see a more um, cooperative kind of spirit to bring these issues to the forefront. comment on that, I mean, every single review that I've read, okay, isn't talking about the kinds of issues that you just raised. The point, the point of it is that the reception of this book, again, depend, I mean, regardless of what the author intended, the reception of this book by the professional book reviewers, who are mostly at this point writing the reviews, this will change, I think, just like, as I pointed out to some people, like what happened 30 years ago with the book Time on the Cross. For six months or so, all the reviews were positive, and then the real reviews came out, and I think things got balanced. Okay, but but the um, but the, the 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 issue here is that all the reviews are not talking about the kinds of issues you're talking about. They are talking about the evil librarians. That's what the reviews are saying, and some of that language is lifted out 
uh, whether quoted from other people or not. I know Paul Conway. He and I have worked on many projects together. Yes, I identify some of those words, okay, used in those things, because Paul, like some of the other people mentioned, are criti critics within their own field of trying to make the improvements and the adjustments, okay? But I think that that's very different from the language, the way it's employed in, in the book and what the reviewers are picking up. I think the public reception is negative towards libraries and archives at the moment because of the book. Now, can we turn it around? I hope, I've heard rumors that the Library of Congress uh, is planning to hold a conference in July. I don't know, yeah, well, oh, whoops. <laughs> Or raise that to the video thing. No, I've heard rumors. I haven't seen it. I tried to find out information. I think there's going to be, I mean, I wrote a letter to a foundation and asked for funding and said, you know, would you fund a conference if we brought 10 or 12 people together to address different aspects of this book and also invited Nicholson Baker. Would you do this? Okay, you know, see if we could find, you know, money to do. I don't know how long he wants to put up with this, but I mean, you know, um, on the other hand, he sort of caused it, so I think he better be prepared to put up with it. Uh, but I think that, you know, I think that the dialogue to get where you're talking about has yet to happen. And I hope that it does. Uh, noticing the conversation, very little has been said about the responsibility of the people who produce the books to contribute to the conservation and preservation. They just dump it out and then walk away and it's left to libraries and archives who turn to the public money to do this. Shouldn't the publishers, the original producers, be responsible for producing major funding for these efforts? I'd like to have comments from either one of you on that. One, uh, New York Times and the New York Forward and a number of other newspapers, the Detroit paper, published a rag paper edition. Uh, that was sold to libraries and bought widely. And um, the, the, uh, the Library of Congress and the New York Public Library had these rag paper editions. When they say why they got rid of them, they say it's because of the inherent vice of the paper. It's because paper crumbles and we had to get rid of them. But they're talking here about editions that were made on paper that is stronger than all books currently published, certainly stronger than any of these books, that, that, that are extremely strong. So there's, there, there's al already been an attempt to make something that would reside permanently in libraries in paper form. And that attempt has been subverted by this kind of indiscriminate approach that, that newspapers are beyond the pale. They're simply not something that we can have in a library in any form other than microfilm. But that will change, I hope. And I mean, I, I certainly wince sometimes when I read the headlines of the, uh, the book reviews because I don't think, because I don't, uh, didn't mean it quite that way. Um, I do think it's heartening that, that um, Richard, if I may use his first name, and I have this important thing in common, which is he says sort of towards the end that the Maybe we should have a moratorium on, on major reformatting projects until we talk about this. Well, that I think is a very important statement because if we could really talk about what the intentions of reformatting projects are, are they, as people like Michael Lesk think, really to change the way libraries do business, to have one single copy in Washington and kind of network facsimiles floating all around, or are they to save things that are terribly impaired and at the point of crumblement. And if we can talk about it and make decisions after that, then we should resume funding um, big microfilming projects. And also, if we can all say to the NEH, give us, fine, you wanted to give us a lot of money for microfilming for a long time, now we would like some money for storage. We would just, just help us out with this task. Because what you did was you distorted all of our decision making by channeling it all towards this, in this one direction of microfilm. So I'm, I'm ha actually heartened by that and also the uh, suggestion that we would make some analytical studies of the actual nature of paper's deterioration because all these studies that are invoked by the Library of Congress are based on the accelerated aging tests where you take paper and you put it in ovens for three days and three days in an accelerated aging oven supposedly equals 25 years of real life and none of those tests have turned out to be true and we really need to find out what paper, 
how paper behaves. I happen to know because I have a lot of hundred-year-old newsprint that was never stored in any kind of air conditioning that was always in ambient British temperatures and humidities. It is in beautiful shape that newsprint, the cheapest and most impermanent supposedly of all papers, is an astonishingly long-lived medium. Uh, just, just let me uh, uh, comment on this thing about the, uh, the responsibility of the creators. I think this is a really important problem. I mean, one of the things, in one of the, the section I didn't read of the paper, I talked a little bit more about this in the light of the newspapers. For example, uh, in order to understand newspapers, which are, and I might add, I mean, one of the other problems with the discussion of the newspapers is that newspapers are portrayed as sort of the fundamental historical record of American society. It isn't. Okay, it is a part of, it is not the most fundamental, it is a highly flawed, problematic document, okay, and it has lots of biases and lots of issues, and one of the things, in order to understand newspapers, we also have to preserve things like the records of the publishers, and how many records of publishers have we managed to salvage? I mean, we've lost a lot of that as well, because these institutions, these businesses, don't take responsibility for those institutional archives. Um, that is a problem. There's comparable articles out there about newspaper morgues and about newspaper photographic collections, some of which have been salvaged at expense of individual archives and, and other efforts of archivists, okay? These, in, these companies did not take responsibility, okay? And it is, I think, a critical issue, as it has been, I think, with the publishing industry as well. And I think that this is these are the kinds of issues that we talk more about. We just can't shift the burden. It, it, it's not just about shifting the burden on the federal government, that's for sure. Um, and yes, there are prior problems with the priorities as they, as they set them from time to time. But they often set them in response to other issues. That is what they hear from the field, but often from what they can get from Congress, okay? And that's a whole political quagmire that is also part of the real world that's very difficult, I think, for us to deal with. It's not rational at all. And people like Fremont Ryder run the show, not just, you know, are sort of figures in it. These people are, you know, kind of people that make the decision. I would like to speak. We have time for just one more relatively brief question, if someone would like to volunteer. I can't promise to be brief. I, I am from the Library of Congress, and I'm here to help you, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's basically a waste of time for us to try to refute some of this uh, applause-generating type rhetoric uh, that's mainly focused on the past. I think what we have to do, I'm speaking now as the National Library, is to really focus on what we have to do for the future. And so I would really like to share with some of my professional colleagues and my fellow alumni from Simmons some of the things that your National Library is doing and was doing long before this book was ever published to help resolve some of the issues that have been discussed today. I had hoped I really might be able just to sit quietly, but this is something I really can't do. And I do want to speak specifically about the conference which we are, in fact, convening. Uh, but I want to mention five different aspects of this. One is that we will finally be opening later this summer, in se early September, the first of the remote storage modules on Route 95 that the Library of Congress has been trying to get congressional funding for for over six years. I mention this mainly to show that it isn't lack of effort, nor is it easy to get money to do things which we know are essential. What is required really are two things, I think, primarily. One is perseverance. And the second is the ability to try to make the best business case. And, and I'm here talking not about financial ones, because I have to say that the argument is not one that could ever be carried based on cost effectiveness. I don't believe that it costs $3 a book to be stored at Duke. I don't believe that they believe that either if you're talking about the cost over an extended period of time, which is what funders are asking you to show. Our argument was based simply upon the fact that we need to be able to maintain these materials in the original form. And secondly, to be able to do it in the kind of conditions that would ensure their longevity. This meant being certain that proper environmental conditions were built into this facility. This took longer, it took money, it took explaining. But I absolutely believe that had we not done that, we would simply have been putting material into a place that would have accelerated its deterioration and you can believe this or not, it's something that we believe, and I'm quite happy that we're able to prevail on this. 
And well, now that we have the modules designed, we can build a roughly an infinite number of them because of the large amount of space that was given to us there. The second is how proud I am of the work that Congress has done and the Library of Congress has done in the area of mass deacidification. While it is perhaps uh, enjoyable for you to talk about DEZ as a military conspiracy type thing, I don't understand quite what your argument was about explosions and military and so on. Again, the important point is that when one method to resolve this actual problem of deteriorating paper proved not to be effective. The Library of Congress with strong congressional support persevered and now has a process that is being used not only by the Library of Congress, but by many Congress of these years. A substantial new infusion of money to do item level conservation. But to get to the point that I was going to, that really got me onto this, that uh, I have called for a meeting at the Library of Congress sometime this summer. Uh, it will be co-sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies, as we know we have to have the user community heavily involved in this, as well as the Council of Library Information Resources, NEH, and the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, this conference is being keyed to the publication of the report of the Council on Library and Information Resources artifact in the library collections, which I know many people are aware of, and if not, you should see on the website. Among the many topics that we will be discussing there uh, is the recommendation which came from the Library of Congress to that task force that there be strong consideration of the creation in the United States of a national repository where the Library of Congress would use its authority under legal deposit to take one copy of every book that is registered for copyright and put it into storage to be kept as a last resort copy, never to be used except as a last resort. And this is something that I have been thinking about for over four years, looking very closely at some of the models that seem to be working in the Scandinavian countries. But in order to do this, this is not a self-evidently desirable thing for the congressional staff to be funding. And so I think it's really critical that we get a large body of users, as well as librarians and archivists, who see the utility of this, help us get dollars put to it, and help us make the argumentation. Otherwise, it really will not happen. Thank you. to both of our speakers today. Um, we can perhaps continue the discussion among ourselves and with them if everyone will join us upstairs in the conference center where you had breakfast this morning for lunch.